I am really excited to be here. Um, first, I want to thank you for choosing this session. Um, the great thing about South by Southwest is there's no shortage of amazing presentations and people to learn from, so I'm truly honored that you're here bright and early, 10 a.m. on a Saturday, to share a journey together. I have actually been thinking about you in this moment for several months, and while we are in this big 700-person room, my goal for this conversation is for it to feel very personal. I've designed this to help you on your individual journey, whether you're at the beginning, the middle, or nearing the finish line of some of your biggest goals. My goal in this conversation is to pay forward some of the lessons I've learned across my career to accelerate your decision making and to help you to reach your biggest goals. As it uh, was stated in the description for this talk, one of the things I want to do the most is to dispel many of the myths that I think surround these larger than life, now celebrity CEOs that are on the covers of magazines and discussed around our kitchen tables. I've had the privilege of working directly for and with many of these people, so I know their habits, their personalities, their best practices, their worst faults, <laughs> very intimately. And what I'm hoping to do today is to help you understand some of their playbooks and to also get out of your head some of these myths that might be holding you back from your greatest potential because you might be opting out because of something that actually is factually not true. So I started my career in tech very unintentionally. I am the first generation in the history of my family who is a non-farmer. Both of my parents were born and raised on potato farms in Idaho. My dad decided that that was not the life for him, and so he joined the Air Force and was chosen to be a fighter pilot flying the F-4 Phantom fighter jet for the first 10 years of my childhood. But um, when he graduated from, graduated, you know, you, you retire, you retire from the military, um, he went to law school and my family moved to Redmond, Washington in 1985, which is the same year that Microsoft announced that as their global headquarters. That single decision changed the course of my life in ways my parents definitely could not have anticipated. I grew up in Redmond surrounded by families and early technologists who were part of that original personal computing revolution. My very first job at 16 years old was working at a five-person startup founded by two brothers who had just graduated from Harvard Business, Harvard Business School. I went to University of Washington in Seattle um, studying international studies, and I graduated in 2002, which was just after two very important events. The first was the launch of the Euro, where it kind of woke me up to emerging global economies for the first time. I had always been interested in languages and cultures and travel and people whose lives and experiences were very different from mine. But because they launched the Euro in 2002, a lot of my studies were around business opportunities and economies and things that hadn't really interested me before. It really opened up my mind to the way that we could be connected as a world in a new way. And the second really important event that happened right before I graduated from undergrad was the dot-com bust. So Seattle back then was a very tech-heavy city, and all of the jobs had disappeared seemingly overnight. So I and all of my fellow graduates had zero job opportunities. And that turned out to be one of the best things that's ever happened to me, because I took some opportunities that I wouldn't have otherwise. So I sent out resumes to, I'm not kidding, at least 100 different places and didn't get a single call back. Not an interview, no free internships, literally radio silence. And while I was um, in undergrad, I worked two student jobs. I worked reshelving books at Suzalo Library, and I also worked at the European Union Center on campus. And the director of my program at the European Union Center knew that I was really struggling to find work after graduation. He knew that my plan A was to do a PhD and to become an academic. That was, I thought the greatest job in the world would be to read and write books for a living. But I really wanted some real world experience before I went into my PhD program. So he suggested that I apply at Amazon. His wife worked in recruiting there and he knew that they were one of the only places hiring. And that is literally the only reason in the world I thought to apply there. It took me nine months to get that job. But my very first job after undergrad was working directly for Jeff Bezos in the foundational years of Amazon. I was given the desk physically closest to his in the entire company. In fact, it's one of those famous door desks that he built with his own two hands that, I don't know, might be in a museum one day. 
But I, that, how I got hired is another story for another day, but that was really the start of my business school. I worked at Amazon for three years, from 2002 to 2005, and then I got into my dream PhD program at Berkeley and moved to California to really go back to my plan A. I had learned a lot about emerging economies. I had really had business skills that I never expected developing. But I was really excited about my course of study and thinking about economies and the larger business community. Then I got recruited by Google, and that's another long story, but I ended up working there for 12 years. The first three years working on the product team under Marissa Meyer, who then went on to become CEO of Yahoo, and then was recruited by the CEO, Eric Schmidt, to really lead his team while he was still CEO, but mostly the reason he recruited me was to help him in the transition of going from CEO to Google's first ever first-time chairman. So I'm gonna share a lot of stories about this crazy unexpected career I had in tech, um, but I really wanted to start off with the foundation of everyone learns line upon line. There's opportunities for all of us to do things, and especially when our plan A's don't work out and opportunities appear limited, sometimes that's the best thing that could ever happen to us. So, as I said, I want this to feel like a one-on-one -on -one conversation. You've just gotten to know me a little bit. What I'd love to do is get to know you a little bit. I'm gonna do a little bit of a game. It's nothing scary. I anticipate that this will be over in less than five questions, probably three. So one of my main goals in this <laughs> session, as I said, was to dispel the myths. As we think about these unicorn celebrity CEOs, they seem larger than life. They seem to have a crystal ball into the future where they're the geniuses who received a fully formed idea from divine inspiration and the path is very clearly laid out in front of them. I'm here to tell you that is not true and it is not serving you. And after I left Google five years ago and now I do consulting work where I partner with CEOs of rapidly scaling organizations to help them fulfill their greatest potential. And I want to do that for you here. And I worry that some of you might be opting out because you think you don't belong among them. So I want to dispel some of these myths right off the bat. So I'm wondering, there's, this is a 700 person room and I can see some of your heads are very, very small. So I wonder, would you humor me and could you like stand up? Because hands aren't enough. If standing is available to you, stand up. Okay, we're gonna play a game. I'm gonna ask you a question and I want you to shout out the first thing that comes to mind when I, when I ask you this question, like loud, because I need to be able to hear it. So what is the gender of this mythical unicorn CEO? Male. If you don't identify as male, have a seat. Okay, that's depressing already. That's, I'm already depressed. If you refuse to sit down and you identify as female, good for you, but only 2% of you will get funding. But stay standing. Okay, second question is, what is the age of this mythical unicorn CEO? Four, I heard 40, that's higher than I expected, but we'll go with that. If you're younger than 40, have a seat. Okay, third question, because I'm guessing we'll be done by five questions. Third question is, where did this CEO go to school? Overwhelmingly, I heard Harvard. If you didn't go to Harvard, and then I'll add an asterisk, and decide to drop out, because the world needed you for sooner, have a seat. Okay, okay. <laughs> I have debated what should be the next question. I will not do the crazy one. I will do this one. <laughs> so what I'm not gonna do is say, what is the personality trait of this person, which is really like the jerk asshole that no one wants to work for, but I'm not gonna ask you to assess yourselves that way. <laughs> so what I'm gonna do instead is shout out what is the first name of this person, the magazine cover you're picturing in your mind of this celebrity CEO right now, what's their first name? Okay, if that's not your name, sit down. <laughs> and no one is left. This is the point of the talk today. What I want for you to do by the end of this is every single one of you is standing because you know that you are qualified for exactly who you are, what your age, your gender, your personality type, your tendencies, your schooling, your education, you belong among them. I'm gonna prove it to you, I promise. Okay, so you all are my sunicorns. <laughs> Aren't you cute? You're so cute, you're like this chubby, cute baby stage. You're just happily going through life. You haven't yet been crushed, maybe, by the weight of your dreams. You are my sunicorns. I want to get you 
okay, we're not gonna maybe be, we're not gonna be this mythical, buff, super jacked, celebrity CEO version. Maybe you will, many of them, that happens. But I want you to embrace fully who you are as my Sunicorns. So what we're gonna use, um, I'm gonna introduce five different personality traits that are common among these great CEOs I've had the privilege of working with, both you know, at Amazon and Google and beyond in my consulting work. There are five common denominators that I've seen. But within these common denominators, there's a range. And I wanna add an asterisk right here. The people, the examples, and the organizations I'm about to share with you are not perfect. They all have flaws, they've all made mistakes, they will be the first to admit it, but I want, just put it out there. If I give an example and you're like, but he, I know, I know he did. But I'm gonna highlight some of the things that I think are their best practices. So within these five personality traits, I'm gonna use what is called the Goldilocks Principle. Also, by the way, every single one of these images is generated by AI. <laughs> so you might notice a couple of like very funny images. In fact, I'll tease one right now. One of the unicorns has two horns and a single ear, so watch for that. Um, but all of these have been generated by artificial intelligence. So I'm gonna use the Goldilocks Principle, which is an economics principle based on a fairy tale called Goldilocks. I live in Europe and I tested this with a couple European friends and they were not um, familiar with the story, so briefly, it is a fairy tale about a girl who gets lost in the forest and finds a home, the home of a family of three bears. There's Papa Bear, Mama Bear, and Baby Bear. And she comes into their home while they're away on a walk, and she tries out their porridge. And Papa Bear's porridge is too hot, Mama Bear's porridge is too cold, and Baby Bear's is just right. Then she tries out the chairs, similar too hard, too soft, just right, and eventually the beds, too hard, too soft, and just right where she falls asleep and is discovered by the bears later. I don't actually know what the moral of this story is, but the principle is that we're, what we're looking for is the just right. So within these five characteristics that I'm gonna share today, I'm gonna be sharing the just right balance because each of these can be taken to the too hot extreme or the too cold and ineffective. So we're looking for that moment of just right. So of these five traits, I'm gonna start somewhere where I think you're not gonna to be too surprised, and I'm gonna ease you into some qualities that I think might surprise you. So the first one is gonna be disagreeableness. Probably not super shocking to you, but there is an element of disagreeableness that is very important if you're trying to do things that no one has ever done before. My definition of disagreeableness is willingness to be misunderstood for long periods of time. You are willing to make yourself and your team and probably your family uncomfortable for long periods of time. This is what I mean by disagreeable. Now the too hot version of this is that stereotypical blowhard jerk of a boss who burns through people and resources and doesn't care about anyone else's opinion and is impossible to negotiate with and they are the smartest person in the room and they have all the right ideas and all their jokes are funny. I don't mean that. That is too hot, and yes, you can probably say, there's someone in the headlines today who I think manages that way, and I will say to you, they're successful despite that behavior, not because. Please don't adopt that, thinking that's the only way to accomplish really difficult things. And also the too soft version of disagreeableness is somebody who constantly feels like they need to lead by consensus. They need everyone to understand and be on board, and they need to convince everyone, and if there's any naysayers, then they're paralyzed by doubt. They're paralyzed by, do I listen to that? Am I ready? Oh, are, are they right? Should I really change my ideas? And they're not able to make traction because they're filled with doubt. Probably not surprising, I'm about to share examples from my time at Amazon, because <laughs> Jeff is a very good example of disagreeableness. I joined Amazon in 2002, as I mentioned, during a time when the company was not yet profitable, if you can imagine such a time. Um, the board of directors was not yet sure of Jeff's vision, and in fact, they were considering bringing in a professional CEO because they weren't sure that his crazy ideas were gonna pan out. They thought he might literally bankrupt the organization on the way. But Jeff has said many, many times in the press, back then and since, that if you're going to do anything new or innovative, you have to be willing to be misunderstood for long periods of time. This is among my favorite things that Jeff has ever said, because of the way he backed it up. So he did this in the seemingly small decisions as well as the big ones. 
Seemingly small decisions were the way that he ran his meetings. He was so committed to having a team that would keep him in check that he made it someone's full-time job to play devil's advocate for him. So in 2002, he created a brand new role that had never existed in the company before that back then was called The Shadow. And The Shadow, uh, the very first one was Andy Jassy, who you might be familiar with now because he became Jeff's successor 19 years later. That's how long the training program was. But Andy Jassy's full-time job was to be an intellectual sparring partner. The first, it was, he did it for about 18 months, just over a year and a half. And at first he was just there to absorb information, to have the same perspective that Jeff had, to be copied on every email, in every meeting, on every flight, literally at Jeff's side at all times. That was one to help him absorb Jeff's way of thinking, learn to problem solve the way that Jeff would so that he could then replicate that decision making and that leadership style in rooms where Jeff could no longer be in because the company has scaled so big. The other part of his job, which was the hardest and probably scariest part, was once he had that foundational knowledge, his job was to poke holes in all of Jeff's favorite ideas, help him see around blind corners. This is disagreeableness. This is not probably the definition you, where you thought I was going with this, but this is inserting active debate into every single decision that, that he made. And I think this is one of the core elements of why Amazon became so successful. So he formulated a team of high-functioning people to support him in doing things that he knew his investors, his shareholders, his employees, his peers really wouldn't understand. And he needed a very, very high-functioning team. And disagreeableness is something that, like if I'm being honest and I was doing that experiment, I might kind of like sit down right now. But I don't love being misunderstood by people. I don't love being judged or people thinking I'm crazy. That for me is very, very uncomfortable. And I think that's why high functioning CEOs are very careful about the team they assemble around them. The right minds, the right temperament, the right risk tolerance and thick skinness. Is that a word? Thick skinness. It's, it's now. I've coined it. Um, but there's a quote by Mark Andreessen, who you might know from Andreessen Horowitz, one of the most successful VC firms in the world, where he says, agreeableness is a problem for innovation. If you're, agree if you're agreeable, you listen to the people around you who tell you that new ideas are stupid. You have to deal with social discomfort to the level of ostracism. Did you mentally just sit down again? <laughs> I don't want to be uncomfortable to the level of ostracism. However, if you're surrounded by a team of people who are so committed to the mission and to accomplishing the goal you've set together, then you feel less ostracized. You have a support system that really helps you in that long run, in the slog when you have those moments of doubt or discomfort or being misunderstood. So in order to survive being disagreeable, you have to assemble a world-class team. And Jeff did this very, very carefully. Um, in my book, Bet on Yourself, I share the long version of the story of how I got hired and the nine months of interviews that I had to go through in order to be hired. So when I got into my dream program at Berkeley um, and I needed to start my PhD, we had reviewed what felt like hundreds of candidates to replace me. I was not the most important person in the company. I was fairly junior, but I did have direct access to Jeff and he was close about the um, team he had around him. And my PhD was about to start and I couldn't change the date of <laughs> starting grad school and I still didn't have a replacement. So I went to Jeff and I begged him, please reconsider some of the candidates that you've rejected. I need time to train someone to take over of where I'm leaving off. And he refused. And he shared with me what has been my hiring bar as I've hired teams ever since. He said, I will only push people, I will only hire people that I have to hold back, not push forward. That is a world-class team. So surrounding yourself with people who are disagreeable in the right ways and willing to do things that no one else would do was a really big key to his success. Now, disagreeableness does have a little bit of what you were expecting. <laughs> this is a tweet from Jeff Bezos himself, and I've underlined two things. First, look at the very bottom and look at the date of this tweet. This is not that long ago. This is October 11th of 2021. He is posting an article from 1999 that still bothers him, that he's still upset about. He actually had in our office at Amazon, in the original Amazon headquarters, we had a couple of things framed on the wall, and one of them was this. 
So this is a Barron's article where in 1999, they declared Amazon.bomb. This was just before I started at the company. And Jeff framed it very beautifully and hung it up on the wall, and he was like, that's what we're gonna prove wrong. Now, Barron's was not wrong because over the next two years, Amazon lost 70% of its value. They weren't wrong in the short term. But Jeff is always very aware that he is not playing the short game. Despite all the pressures of his investors, who had just lost billions of dollars overnight in the dot-com crash, he was committed to deliver as much value to them as possible, and he knew that that would come by playing the long game. So Jeff always said this in our meetings as we were making hard decisions. We were gonna avoid the trap of short-termism. Short-termism is being tempted to have an easy win. And it is very tempting to do because your investors want to win now. Your employees want something to brag about at Thanksgiving or when they go home for Christmas. You want to prove to everyone that you were right. But sometimes the bigger offering that you have comes in the long term. Jeff was um, very, I don't know how he got this instinct so early, but from a, the earliest stages of Amazon's growth, he never looked at horizons that were less than two to three years. In fact, his sweet spot was seven year horizons. And he did three major launches while I was working directly for him that took minimum seven years to even have traction to know if it was a good idea. The first was Amazon Prime, and this was when the board was considering of replacing him with a professional CEO because they thought he would bankrupt the company. But he described Prime as something that was digging a moat around his customers so that they would have this relationship of trust. Remember, this is a time when putting your credit card online was very scary and vulnerable feeling. He was teaching people to trust Amazon to come back over and over again. Uh, the second thing was Kindle. The Kindle was not only a software problem, a behavioral, uh, new behavioral trend for users, but he also had to build hardware and networks that didn't yet exist. The wireless technology wasn't there. He had to really invent something that had never existed before, but he was so sure that this was an important part of our growth that he committed incredible resources to it. There's many examples I can give of that, but one of my favorite examples of him refusing to take a short-term win was the second thing he had framed in our office which was a letter from a publisher within the first couple of years of Amazon really like building its brand reputation. And a publisher had written to Jeff and said, you know, uh, your business model is to sell books. And I think you're making a huge mistake with customer reviews. Because if people are reading all these negative reviews, you're not gonna make any money. And Jeff wholeheartedly rejected that proposal. He said, as he thought about Amazon, he was not there to sell books. He was there to help consumers make educated purchase decisions. And that's a huge difference in mindset. He was there for the long run. He wanted people to trust Amazon and the independent uh, buying decisions that they were making there and that they would be giving the right information so that they would be educated in their purchases. That was a long-term decision. And to Jeff's credit, he was right that in his tenure as CEO, he had a 12,431% shareholder return because he kept his mind on that long-term horizon. And this, to me, is the ultimate example of being disagreeable. Not caving to his shareholders, to his board of directors, to his peers, to the critics, to everyone who doubted him, to the Amazon.bomb headlines. He stayed true to the long-term vision of serving his, his customers and always making sure they had a seat at the table. So, how do we translate this for us normal people? Us in our little adorable Sunicorn states. How, are, how can we do this? Um, there is a social science principle called clustering, which we've seen many times in history when you think about the greats. If you think about the great philosophers, they clustered in Greece. You think about the great artists and painters, you think about Renaissance Italy. If you're thinking about amazing fashion houses, you might think of France. Or if you think about tech, we have Silicon Valley. Or the world's changing unicorns are right here in South by Southwest, which is why you came here. So think about an opportunity where you can cluster with like-minded people. I live in small town Spain now, which is like a long story of how I got from the heart of Silicon Valley to small town Spain. This for me is among the biggest challenges for me. I have to be very purposeful in showing up in places where I know that like-minded people are gonna be working on hard, big, ambitious problems like I am, because that's not available to me just down you know, at my corner coffee shop like it was when I lived in Silicon Valley. 
But thanks to the internet, there are many opportunities for us to cluster and be gathered by like-minded people. Because if we're gonna do something that makes our families doubt our sanity, makes our friends not understand what we're doing, and really separate us from our peers to the level of ostracism, we need to find like-minded people. So here's the formula for how to gain confidence when you're in these moments of doubt and hardship. Uh, this is an amazing neuroscientist who said, get into rigorous environments that challenge you and will build up a thick skin. I am very grateful to the universe for putting me in some very scary environments. I was thrown into the deep end of the ocean pool of the world of entrepreneurship way before I was ready, and I am extremely grateful for that trend. So seek out environments where people are challenging and doing new things, and so you don't feel as alone. That's the best way to be disagreeable. So the second of our five personality traits is intelligence. Again, probably not a surprise. I'm still staying within the zone of probably what you were expecting. But my definition of intelligence is special for entrepreneurs. Uh, yes, you're wildly smart. Of course, that applies. But more important than that, I think the true intelligence needed to be a unicorn leader is being able to process massive amounts of information distill it down to unique observations and be able to see opportunities that other people have missed. You're connecting dots that have never been connected before and you're not being overwhelmed by charting a path that no one has ever done before. To me, that's the intelligence I'm looking for when I'm hiring teams or I'm considering taking on a CEO client. That's really what I'm looking for. Now, going back to our Goldilocks principle, the too hot version of that is somebody who is all over the place. You're kind of trying to analyze all the possible data and you get paralyzed. You have this paralysis of what am I going to do? Have I da gathered the right data? Do I know um, that this big bet I'm making is, is, is going to pay off? And the too cold version is you never get started. You're not gleaning information. You're not exposed to new sources of ideas, emerging technologies, people and talent and trends happening. And so intelligence for me is about gathering as much possible information as you can and using that to empower your business plans. One of my favorite examples of intelligence is Satya Nadella, the CEO of Microsoft. He has a very unusual path, actually. Um, so Satya wanted to get into technology early and he applied um, to the Indian Institute of Technology and he failed the entrance exam. Many people could have taken that as a sign of like, I guess I'm not really smart enough to hack it in this world. I am unqualified, the IIT has rejected me, they're the intellectual body who is kind of proving if I belong here or not. But instead of doing that, he took an un, a non-traditional path into his career in tech. And then he worked for 22 years at Microsoft before he was qualified and chosen to be the third CEO. And then he inherited a very challenging <laughs> Uh, cultural moment within this company. As I mentioned, I'm from Redmond, Washington, and I was surrounded by this energy, this enthusiasm of, of the early personal computing revolution, and then something weird happened. It kind of lost its shine, and people got really jaded, and, and the company became very encumbered and heavy and slow to pivot, and that's kind of the, the company that had this internal conflict is what Sacha inherited. And he did something that I think is brilliant that more organizations need to do. And he called this cultural shift going from a know-it-all culture to a learn-it-all culture. And this he got with, inspired by a professor at Stanford, uh, Carol Dweck, who wrote, if I had to pick one book that has changed my life, it would be hers, which is called Mindset. I promise you, just read the introduction and it could be it, for me, it was a mind explosion. It was, it was a moment where she, she describes how there are two mindsets around learning and intelligence. One is a fixed mindset where we believe that we are born with innate qualities. And we, this is where um, imposter syndrome comes from because when it, we're exposed to the limits today, we feel like we're being exposed as imposter because in our subconscious, we don't believe that we will ever approve upon that. However, you can move from a fixed mindset into a growth mindset and people who have a growth mindset believe that with effort and practice and hardship and pivoting, they can increase their talents. They can literally increase their intelligence over time with applied effort. And that's the cultural shift that Sacha brought to Microsoft. 
there's a really funny story from the 90s um, where they were doing the first they were doing a new graphical user interface, so they brought in people and they were, they were doing UX UI studies to see how people would interact with it so they could design it. And the UI researchers came back to the engineers who had built this graphical inf interface, and they said six out of 10 people find this too confusing. They, they just don't understand it. And the lead engineer said to the researcher, where did you find six idiots? Like that <laughs> is a know-it-all culture. So what we really need to do is shift from that attitude of we're smarter than you and we're gonna tell you how to use it to really embracing the fact that their users were part of the process. And if this was confusing, it was a design issue. It was not that their users were stupid. I think that's a perfect encapsulation of this. Another great example of a CEO that I think did really important things around the concept of intelligence and who belongs working in tech is Jeannie Romady, who's the former CEO of IBM. She also had a very, very unexpected entrance into technology. When she was very young, her father left the family, and not only left them, but left them homeless. Her mother had a high school education and literally zero work experience and suddenly needed to provide for her family. Jeannie was very, very smart and realized that she needed to create opportunities for herself. So she studied very hard and she took school very seriously and she became one of the only women in her engineering program at university. She said most classes she was the only woman, at best there were two. So she knew that everything she contributed, everything she said, every question she asked was going to be remembered, and so she used her disadvantage to an advantage, and she over-prepared. Everyone else who was like, of course I belong in this class, or of course I'm gonna get that job, or of course I'm gonna get this promotion, she would outwork them. And more importantly than outwork them, she would outcare them because she wanted it more. She had more on the line. She did not have a safety blanket. And so she had to create opportunities for herself. And when she became a leader within tech, she realized that aptitude and access are very different things. So she created non-traditional pathways into her teams for people who maybe didn't have a traditional four-year university education had opportunities to learn core skills that were really important to her and her team and the success of the growth. And that's how she got recognized as a leader, how she anticipated where tech was going, and she gave opportunities to people that otherwise normally would have been ignored. This is why diversity is so important. Um, I can't think of a better example than somebody like Jeannie who has really embraced multiple pathways. I think she was 20 years ahead of her time. We're seeing this a lot more now, especially with AI where Maybe four-year universities aren't gonna be able to keep up with the pace of emerging tech, and so we need a lot more up-leveling, upskilling, tra non-traditional entry paths into tech than ever before. And I am a firm believer that the future opportunities inevitably lie outside our current expertise. Every single person in this room probably has felt a little bit of discomfort over the last year or so, or a couple months, thinking how is artificial intelligence gonna disrupt me? What are the skills that I need to future-proof my career going forward? How can I become irreplicable or essential within my organization when things are changing so fast? And it can feel a little threatening. We can go back to that maybe fear response. So the best way to do this is to fully embrace that mindset that Professor Dweck was talking about, which is moving from fear, which is around a fixed mindset, and fully embracing the growth mindset. Not finding it threatening, but exciting to move into new areas and to learn new things. So I'm a huge fan of Andrew Huberman. Do we have any other Huberman fans here? Okay, in my Spotify wrapped, I was in the top 1% listeners. That's, that's my nerd level badge right there. But um, Andrew Huberman is a um, neurobiologist and ophthalmologist at Stanford University in their School of Medicine. Highly recommend the Huberman Lab podcast. He um, talks about incredible emerging research and how we apply into our, our days today, especially for people like us who have really big goals and want to be as efficient as possible. I highly recommend looking up, um, he's got a whole download on this nine-step neuroplasticity super protocol. And, um, it's, in fact, I should have said this at the beginning, but on my website, I have a summary of everything I'm talking about in this talk, including five books, 17 articles, three podcasts, and a couple more newspaper articles, all the sources that I've brought together into this talk. If you go to my website under free resources, there's a download, you'll see our unicorn, you'll know you're in the right place. I have a link to this super protocol. I'm just gonna talk about two of them, because we don't have time to go through all nine. My two favorites are this. 
One is about experimentation. Uh, co computational modeling has shown that humans learn best when there's about a 15% error rate. Okay, you might be like, what am I supposed to do with that? I don't know how to like engineer a 15% error rate in my life. Fair, that's fair. So what I've done in the past is when I'm considering, um, and I wanna measure where I'm at in my career, maybe I'm looking to take on a new challenge or I'm learning a new skill. You can do a calendar audit, for example. You might look at your day, look at all the meetings on your calendar and really evaluate what percentage of my day am I fully in my zone of genius. I'm in that room because I'm the one who knows exactly what to do and I'm answering all the questions. For me, I get a little bored if it's more than 80%. Like, of course I need to spend a good portion of my day being there to deliver my, my particular KPIs, the, the role I was hired to do. But I get bored if it's a higher percentage than about 80%. According to Huberman, it should be higher than that. So that would be an indicator to you to take on a new skill, volunteer for a new cross-functional project, get outside your comfort zone, go to a new conference, experience something new, look for that 15%. As I mentioned, I live in Europe, I live in Spain now, I have daily opportunities to humiliate myself in Spanish, so I'm looking for that 15% error rate, which means speaking in the past tense, because I'm still horrible at it. So it's an opportunity to invite that in. But here's the secret to this, is there's an incredible thing that happens in your brain when you make a mistake. It wakes up all these neurons in your brain that had been dormant. And if you capitalize immediately on correcting that mistake immediately after you make it, you are 10 times more likely to retain that information. So the neural pro protocol here is to seize on that as an opportunity to really cement the learning. So if I make a grammar mistake in past tense and I embarrass myself and I say, oh, and then I try again, it's more likely to stick and I'm less likely to make that same mistake. So 15% error rate rule has higher learning. My second favorite is the gap effect. The gap effect, my sunicorns, is my favorite. So the gap effect is where we are looking <laughs> at um, where we are now and connecting it to where we want to be, and we are in a moment of massive discomfort. Let's say, let's use Spanish again. Let's say I'm really trying to learn a complex um, you know, thing, and I, I get it wrong. If you get this moment of overwhelm, like I just did because I lost my train of thought, and you pause, the sweet spot is 10 seconds. Let's say you're doing piano drills or practicing a foreign language or something like that. If you pause and allow your brain to kind of spin in the background, you get a 10x return on your neural firing from that moment of pause. Rather than pushing through and stumbling through your words and, and trying to cover up your tracks, if you take a pause in a meeting when your decision making is really complicated or you've made a mistake, the neurons in your brain in the hippocampus will literally replicate the um, neural firings that you have in deep sleep if you just take a 10 second pause. So embrace those gap effects, embrace the awkwardness of those moments, and don't try and fill the silence. Don't try and cover your tracks, but let your brain have some space to spin and have that 10x return on your learning. That's my favorite. Okay, all nine protocols are amazing, but the gap effect is really incredible. Okay, so this brings us to trait number three. This is where we're gonna get a little more outside of what you expected me to say. So openness is to me when you are bringing in ideas, thoughts, challenges, perspectives that are outside your own. This is when we get into what social scientists um, call moving away from your close ties or your strong ties to your close ties. So strong ties are people who went to the same university as you, they went to the same school, they had the same training, maybe same cultural heritage, they look like you, they talk like you. These are the people you have a lot in common with. This kind of happens a lot in teams where we hire people that we wanna hang out with so we end up with a lot of very sameness. But we want the weak ties. We wanna look for opportunities. For example, you go to um, a sporting event. You're sitting next to a stranger and you both are supporting the same team. But they're probably from a different hometown or went to a different school or in a different job. And you're gonna have a very different conversation with that person that's gonna be richer and give you more ideas. The best entrepreneurs have systems to invite openness into their teams, their processes, and their procedures. I am a big believer <laughs> that confidence can peacefully coexist with humility. It takes a lot of humility 
to invite people into your teams who think differently than you do, who are pushing back on your assumptions or your heartfelt ideas, and who are, as, as Andy Jassy did to Jeff Bezos, poking holes in all your favorite ideas because it makes the entire room elevate in their ideas. So a great example of this is Terrence Riley. Terrence Riley was the CEO of Crocs way before they were cool, if we can call them cool now, I'm not sure. I don't own any. But he was there in this moment of transition, and now he's CEO of Stanley. He has incredible examples from both organizations of him doing something I thought, I would have thought was impossible. So let's take Crocs, for example. He was the CMO, I know I said CEO there, he was the CMO of Crocs, and uh, his daughters were mortified. They were like tweens at the time, and they were like, you cannot work at Crocs. So embarrassing. But he was a um, big believer in the product, he was very committed to his job, and there was a woman named Toria, who one month earlier had just finished her internship, and she walked into his office, which I think says a lot about him as a CMO, and she had a photo. There had just been a photo published of Post Malone wearing Crocs non-ironically. And she was like, this is a moment. And he was crazy enough to be like, oh my gosh, I think you're right. Now, if you don't know Post Malone, he's got kind of like scribbled tattoos all over his face. Not exactly what I would have assumed was their core demographic at the time. But Post Malone just happened to be a super big fan of Crocs. And so Tori proposed to her CMO, what if we like reached out to him and did some kind of photo op? And her crazy idea became a full-on collaboration with Post Malone that crashed their website and sold out instantly and kind of changed the coolness factor of Crocs. Now this, to me, is an ultimate example of openness of an executive. To take an idea from probably the junior most person, not only on his team, but in the entire company, because she had just been an intern a few weeks before, and they did something seemingly insane that I'm sure made his executive teammates kind of question his sanity. I'm sure it wasn't obvious that this was gonna work out, but it really worked out in a way. So that might be a blip. That might be more to Toria's credit than to Torrance's, maybe. But then it happened again. He became CEO of Stanley, you know, the tumblers, the, the water bottles, and he um, became CEO of Stanley in April of 2020. I can't imagine a more horrendous time to become a new CEO of an organization. He was an outside hire, which is always very, very challenging, and he had to do so fully remotely during a time of crisis when nobody really knew the playbook for what was about to happen. And again, this pattern happened. He had um, a a teammate, Lauren, who came to him one day and said, have you ever heard of this thing called Buyers Club? It's a small group of women in Utah who have this email list and they just share products that they're really excited about and they're in love with a Stanley Tumblr. Stanley Tumblr, it's hard to say. Um, and he was like, that's weird, because if you know Stanley, it's a 107 year old brand and their slogan was always Stanley Strong. This is like, the thermos that your grandpa would take fishing. It's always in this industrial green. It is the least likely thing to catch on among Utah moms. But the evidence was there. They had raving fans, and so he was like, all right, let's have a conversation with them. Again, seemingly crazy. He brought in this group, the Buyers Club. They had a meeting, and he said, all right, I really want to test your theory that we have an untapped demographic here. They, he offered them to buy 5,000 of these tumblers and to see if they could sell it to their subscribers. Sold out immediately. To the credit of these women, they were pretty like, impressive. They took out all the equity they had in their company. They took out a loan to be able to buy these 5,000 water bottles thinking that they were right, and it, they proved themselves right. So Stanley then had the, or, sorry, Torrance then had the information to take it to his Stanley executives and board and say, we need to change something. We've been missing and ignoring an entire demographic that really wants the pro product that we're making. And now, because he listened to this seemingly crazy idea, he was open to information. He really was able to turn around a 107-year-old brand and had a 7x return. He went from, sorry, 10x. He had a 10x return going from 7 million in revenue to 70 million in revenue in less than two years. It is now described as the Birkin bag of water bottles. You need a color for every outfit, you need some, I, I don't own one, but it's huge. And he really embraced the fact that there is a new way of marketing things where he invited this viral sensation that happened on TikTok to come in and to be part of the brand identity and to really grow it. Another great example of openness is Brian Chesky. Brian is, impressive in many ways, but I actually learned something new about his journey just recently. 
He hired um, an executive named Chip Conley, who had been CEO of a boutique organization, a, a boutique hotel chain called the Joie de Vivre in California, and he brought him in as the expert on hospitality and entrepreneurship. And Chip came in, um, you know, not from a tech perspective, he was just this, you know, expert in hospitality, but he, Brian started calling him the, what did he call him? The elder, the modern elder of Airbnb. And Chip didn't really love that unofficial title at first, but he was 52 at the time, and the average age of the Airbnb employees was 26, so he was literally double their age. But what he converted that, the reason why he embraced this term modern elder was when Brian defined it to him, he said it was someone who was equal parts curious and wise. And he thought, okay, I, I can work with that. And so the way that the Chip approached his roles in these meetings was he called it a mentor. He was there as a mentor and an intern. He was a mentor because he had expertise that no one else in the room had, but he also asked the stupid questions that a first day intern might because he was in a new environment applying his knowledge in a skill set in a completely different way. So both Brian and Chip, I think are great examples of openness, of taking different ideas. And they survived the storm, which was when Airbnb that was preparing for the IPO lost 80% of their revenue over just a few weeks at the beginning of the pandemic. And I think it's because they had this openness that they were able to survive that storm and have a very successful IPO. So for you, I really encourage you to protect time for curating the people and the ideas around you. Be very purposeful on getting inspiration from new sources, getting outside of your strong ties, going into your weak ties, and bringing in voices, perspectives, and expertise that wouldn't otherwise just be in front of you. The next is low neuroticism. Now, okay, this is where I'm challenging some of your ideas. You probably, so my definition of low neuroticism is somebody that is emotionally regulated. This is somebody you're able to curate your emotions, you're not flying off the handle, you can be the calm in the storm. Yes, there are people on headlines today that aren't behaving this way who are unicorn CEOs, but I think it's to their detriment. So what we wanna do is move away from this and move into a leadership style where we can really use this to our greatest advantage. I think Pixar is a great example of this. If you haven't read Creativity Inc., I highly encourage this. It, there's um, an amazing story. So when I, moved, when I got into my PhD program at Berkeley, I, um, I moved to, what's it called, Emeryville, which is this one square mile town between Berkeley and Oakland, California. And there, that's where head, uh, Pixar is headquartered. So I had a lot of friends who worked here. And um, I highly encourage you to read the story of how they saved Toy Story 2. It's a long story of how it became a disaster. They'd just done this merger with Disney, and Toy Story 2 was supposed to go direct to video. They didn't have a model for doing that yet. They were just used to one particular standard, and they were asked to lower their standard for direct to video, and it was a huge catastrophe. With only eight months to go, uh, they had to really save it from the fires. They nearly burnt out their entire team. 30% of their employees had repetitive stress injuries, like carpal tunnel, because of the stress they got put under. But two really important things came out of this. One was what they called the brain trust, where they had the five experts who had no decision-making power on the project would come in and do independent reviews to, to lend their expertise. And the second was they used that brain trust in, in a process they called the dailies. This is something I actually used at Google um, because I had seen it modeled at Pixar and also in some of the ways that Jeff ran his meetings at, at Amazon. The dailies is an opportunity for senior level executives to give their feedback to the whole team. They didn't have time to waste in this Toy, Toy Story 2 disaster moment. So the executives are able to give high level, high um, quality critiques to the whole team. The second thing that happened was they were then forced to show their work in progress. We didn't have the luxury of waiting until we were done with it and it was polished enough to show my boss. Everyone was reviewing everything in process. And third was ideas and conversations were coming from all levels, not just the, the um, executives in the room were speaking, but the engineers, the junior most people were sharing ideas. Everything was happening in real time. And I think that's one of the reasons why Pixar has been so successful. I'm gonna skip over this in interest of time but um, this is another person. Crucible moments, I think, are a really important principle. Uh, Roloff Botha has an incredible podcast called Crucible Moments. Highly recommend a, a listen. Some of my top favorite podcast episodes ever are there. What I want to get to, my unicorns, is how do we increase our tenacity? There's a protocol, again, I've stolen from uh, Professor Huberman at Stanford, that's called, um, it's where you, 
are able to channel a part of your brain called the anterior mid-cingulate cortex. Very fancy long word for a tiny, tiny part of your brain that we can literally flex like a muscle. It literally will get bigger with more use and it increases your willingness to be misunderstood <laughs> over long periods of time and to be very tenacious. And the way you flex this part of your brain is by doing things you don't want to, but you know are in your greater good. For example, you're doing marathon training and you really don't wanna go on that run today, but you do it anyway, this part of your brain is ignited and flexed. Or um, you're trying to build muscle mass and so you're trying to double the protein intake. You don't wanna eat another chicken breast today, but you do it anyway. So it's either doing, avoiding things that you need to stop doing or doing things that you have no desire to do that literally grow this part of your brain. And it is literally like a muscle where you'll be more tenacious through this. Last of our five qualities is conscientiousness. Again, probably not the first thing that you think of when you think of these like crazy unicorn CEOs. Conscientiousness to me is about long-term goal setting. This is about keeping a high, high standard quality even when the finish line is very far away from you. Adam Grant, I'm a big fan, social psychologist from Wharton. He has a great book, Hidden Potential, and I just loved this. It's the perfect encapsulation of everything I'm trying to pass on to you today. Is Really, success comes from being willing to make more mistakes than others even make attempts. And I think there's so much that happens in building that muscle, that resilience of knowing that if it wasn't perfect this time, I can pivot. I now have more data that I had than I had before, and I'm able to show up tomorrow smarter than I was today. This is South By, so I want to have a non-tech example, but I think Ed Sheeran is a great example of this iterative process. One of my favorite things about Ed Sheeran is in pretty much every press interview I've ever seen him give, he plays a recording of himself at 14 years old um, that's terrible. Because everyone's like, oh, you've got this God-given talent, this is all so easy to you, and he loves proving that it's not. It was hard work, and he has... He was willing to humiliate himself. The price of admission for his greatness was being able to have people be introduced to him in his novice zone when he wasn't perfect, when he didn't have that breath control, he didn't have that presence. There's an amazing documentary about him called The Sum of It All, which I think is a great subtitle for this talk, which um, he, he talks about this process of this, you know, ginger-haired, country boy with a stutter and who loved to beatbox, becoming this like megastar, impossible. But he did it iteratively because he couldn't imagine being anyone else. He felt a calling so deep inside of him that he couldn't turn that voice off. And he is a great example of this showing up, being willing to do it because you feel so pulled towards it. At Google, we were pretty famous for launching early and often. Things were rarely perfect when we did. And I just love this um, by Reid Hoffman that says, if you're not embarrassed by the first, verse, first version of your product, you've launched too late. I probably say this on a daily basis to my clients because you care so deeply about it. You want it to be perfect. But if we're so obsessed with this, it becomes perfectionist paralysis and we're not serving the greater good that we wanted to. The last thing and the last thing that I wanted to bring out was you might think, but I don't live in Silicon Valley. I don't live in these places. I'm not surrounded by these kind of teams. Take an example from Melanie Perkins. Melanie Perkins is the CEO of Canva. I used her product to design this PowerPoint deck. And she is um, from Perth, Australia. She was rejected by more than 100 investors before she was able to get her first big investment. She lives in Perth on the other side of the world from where she was trying to raise money. And so she taught herself to kite surf because those uh, Sand Hill Road investors were coming down there to kite surf, so she thought, all right, they're in my backyard, I'm gonna start doing what they're doing. And so she taught herself to kite surf. I think she's a great example of not using that as an excuse and being very tenacious. Her story is rich and exciting, but I think it's encapsulated by the final protocol I'd like to introduce to you, which is pursuit mode. There's a professor, Emily Balsetis, where she studied what's called a pursuit mode in a very interesting experiment where she had two groups of people and she put very heavy ankle weights on their legs and asked them to run from here to, say, the door. They're at a finish line. In the first group, she gave no instructions. They just ran as best they could with these you know, big weights on their legs. And in the second group, she asked them to focus visually and never lose their sight of the finish line. That second team that visualized the finish line did it with 17% less effort, less perceived effort, and 23% faster than the group had not been given that. 
our mindsets literally can create physical, physiological changes in our bodies. Let's not underestimate the power of what our brains can do. And she calls this pursuit mode. Keep yourself focused on that finish line, even if you have to create what I call false finish lines along the way. The markers that you're making progress, the markers that your teams can be congratulated. Find the little wins and the things to celebrate. The last thing I want to leave you with is a fortune cover. This is from nine years ago, our unicorns here. And then um, our unicorpses are literally the cover of fortune right now. This month, this is what I want to prevent from you. I want you to be fully these, <laughs> these beautiful, fully formed unicorns and not unicorpses. And I hope that the principles that I've shared to you today and some of the myths that hopefully we've dispelled can give you permission to show up the world needs you, you uniquely you, your gender, your background, your diversity of thought and experience will create a purposeful future of which we can all be proud. And if I can leave you with just one last quote, it's by Greg Hoffman, former uh, CMO of Nike, where he said, somehow we've come to believe that greatness is a gift reserved for a chosen few, for prodigies, for superstars, and the rest of us can only stand by watching. You can forget that. Greatness is not some rare DNA strand. Greatness is no more unique to us than breathing. We are all capable of it, all of us. So I hope you'll show up. I hope that every single one of you is standing now in your mind because you belong in this group. We've dispelled the myths. You know you are qualified to be here. And the world needs you more than ever. With artificial intelligence and how quickly things are changing, we need everyone participating. We more, need more diversity than less. And so I hope you'll join me. Thank you.